This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Once again, it's time for Mises Weekends. Very pleased to be joined this weekend with our friend, Gabriel Calzada, visiting us from Guatemala, originally from the Canary Islands near Spain. Uh, For those of you who aren't familiar with Gabriel, you should be. Uh, He is absolutely a superstar in the Austro-Libertarian world. A little bit of background. He is, of course, president, heads up UFM in uh, Guatemala City, which is the Universidad Francisco Marroquin. Uh, which is an unbelievable free market university uh, that serves Central America. He is also a protege and a one-time student of Huerto de Soto, obtaining his PhD in Spain. He is the president of APEE, the Association of Private Enterprise Education. He sits on the board of the Mont Pelerin Society. But for our purposes, most importantly, he's a former fellow here at the Mises Institute and someone who, who has known Lou Rockwell and many of our staff for a long time. So that said... Welcome to Auburn. It's great to see you. Thank you, Jeff. It's so great to be here at the Mises Institute. Well, I want to start off, before we get into UFM, I want to start off by talking about uh, Huerta de Soto a little bit, a man you know very well, and really underappreciated in in the Austrian world. I mean, I think his name should be uh, discussed in in the same terms as a Hoppe or a Rothbard in terms of, of what he's done in this incredible book, Money, bank credit, and economic cycles, which, as as I'm sure you probably recall, uh, Guido Holzman says is the most important money and banking book since Theory of Money and Credit by Mises. Yes, I remember that uh, that piece by Guido Holzman, uh, and I also remember that Guido Holzman said something very interesting, uh, very interesting about that book. That is, the book is a clear example uh, about what is Austrian uh, public choice theory and how to combine law. Uh, and how to combine um, uh, economics in a book uh, making sense and 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 following the Austrian the Austrian tradition. So I, I think it's a it's a wonderful book um, in in terms of uh, uh, history. Uh, it's amazing what you can learn uh, about history of money uh, reading the book, but also in terms of uh, legal aspects and economic aspects of business cycle and monetary theory. This is wonderful. Right. And the book's very cheap in paperback. Uh, it's also available for free in PDF form in our site. So so look it up. Um, do you stay in touch with DeSoto and tell us about his influence on you and your own scholarship? Oh, yeah. I, I stay in touch with him. Um, the, the way I, I – well, I, I discovered the Austrian school um, thanks to the professors that were criticizing the Austrian school uh, in my um, college years. And so I started reading, and I thought I was uh, the only person following the Austrian school, like many before the internet. And <laughs> one day someone t- told me, there is this great scholar called Jesus Huerta de Soto, who has an Austrian seminar. I went to the seminar, and, and since then I have been mm, collaborating with him. Uh, we started, uh, I helped him starting the the PhD program in, in, uh, in Austrian economics in, in Madrid. And uh, we have collaborated in, in many different uh, activities. Um, he's uh, very active. He's, uh, he continues being very active. His program is, uh, well, he receives students from all over the world. And he's doing an amazing job in, in um, continuing the Austrian tradition in the Spanish-speaking world, but also outside the Spanish-speaking world with students from, from, from America, from all European countries. And, and, and many of them applying the theory, not trying to reinvent the wheel, but applying the theory to specific uh, uh, areas. So it's, it's great what's going on there. Now talk a little bit about the uh, Spanish scholastics and the School of Salamanca and, and the influence that has on you and, and has had on the, the Spanish-speaking libertarian world. I think the Spanish scholastic is, is a very um, rich tradition, and it's very important for the Spanish-speaking world because uh, many people, when you tell them about the um, uh, uh, libertarianism, and you start talking about John Locke or, or even uh, even Menger and and Mises, people say, "Yeah, but but this is like this is foreign to us, right? It's not right. part of our culture." But when you start talking to them uh, about uh, Juan de Mariana, uh, Diego de Covarrubias, uh, Luis de Molina, uh, Francisco de Vitoria. Those are people that they recognize as, as part of their tradition. In fact, they were writing about uh, 
against price control uh, in favor of free prices, uh, against taxation and uh, uh, against inflation, long before um, the, the Scottish Enlightenment. And and uh, this for many people uh, to see that in their culture. There were those those free marketeers uh, defending individual liberty, defending human rights uh, from an individual uh, point of view, uh, private property. This this uh, makes them pay attention to the tradition and see and, and understand understand where our ideas come from and and root them into the culture. Uh, for example, uh, many of the Golden Age uh, writers like Lope de Vega, Quevedo, even Cervantes uh, mm-hmm. are related to that tradition. And what they wrote is related to, to the free market ideas, to the libertarian ideas, we could say, uh, that was, were developed by, by this uh, author. So it's, it's a very important tradition, I think, for all free marketeers around the world, but it's especially important for the Spanish-speaking world. But if you don't know that history, I think it's easy to fall into a, a Western bias that, that Latin America today is is not very Austrian or libertarian friendly. Let me give you a quote. This is actually from the Templeton Foundation. Um, it says, quote, the Spanish-speaking world lacks classical liberal values. The allure of figures like Che Guevara and Castro are symptoms of the failure to grasp the intellectual foundations, economic processes, and social benefits of individual freedom. Now, you spent a lot of time living and working in Latin America. Do you think that's an overstatement and you think things are more promising than that? I think right now things are things are promising in, in, in terms of liberty in Latin America. If you see the changes in the last three years, especially uh, people going into the streets in Guatemala against uh, a race of taxes, or people going in Brazil against corruption, but also against the big government. This is uh, these are very good news for for liberty in Latin America, and uh, it is true that. Uh, but that what uh, what you just read? But I think this is also what a lot of people think about Latin America. The the way a lot of people have been. Um, um, uh, imagining or visualizing Latin America. Uh, what is going on in Latin America is richer than that and uh, and fortunately in recent years is, is moving uh, toward um, more freedom uh, and, and less government in many countries. Uh, do you think uh, Venezuela is serving as a cautionary tale for some of its neighbors and what's happening there? Most probably. People have saw a country like uh, Venezuela uh, being one of the promising and rich countries in the region becoming a complete mess a disaster because of socialism and uh, and that that helps a lot uh, unfortunately a lot of people a lot of friends uh, are suffering in, in Venezuela but uh, I, I think this has helped a lot in other countries uh, also to the younger generations when they listen to politicians saying similar things to what they have heard in in Venezuela to say no 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 come on that, that's let's be realistic uh, let's respect prior property people have in mind this image of Hugo Chavez in the middle of in, in, in downtown Caracas saying oh and who is the owner of that building oh this is a private building expropriated uh, confiscated and people have this in the in their in their memory now uh, and and uh, and a lot of people know now where this leads to, and uh, and I think this has been uh, very unfortunate, but helpful in that sense. Uh, people in the U.S. who aren't as familiar with UFM as they might be will post a link to it, but it, it's a very robust, fully private university. You offer degrees in medicine and economics, architecture, uh, business, you name it. Um, this is a very robust and, and as I say, fully private university. Talk a little bit about, you mentioned off, off camera that the uh, Guatemalan Constitution uh, institutes a separation of education and state, for example. Yes, uh, and this was not always like that, but in, in 1985, uh, the founder of UFM, Manuela Yao, the main founder, uh, managed to convince uh, the political elite to, to, to include a couple of articles in the Constitution that make universities complete independent from the political power. 
uh, completely dependent from government, from the state. Uh, so the universities uh, are not uh, subjected to any type of tax action. They can, uh, they don't need to be accredited. Whatever the board of directors decides is automatically official titles that they are issuing, as if they were accredited, and 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 they are completely independent. So you have a lot of competition. Uh, you have uh, several very good universities competing and and being able to be flexible uh, thanks to that uh, independency so it's 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 a great place to to experiment and to avoid the the vicious cycles that in other countries we we have seen around higher education now you mentioned that regardless of your major there's a core of five or six uh, classes on on the scholarship of liberty that are required. Yes, exactly. Our core curriculum is on liberty. The university was created because a group of young entrepreneurs um, discovered after discussing a lot uh, that they didn't understand why Guatemala was poor. They wanted to understand it deeply, and they didn't uh, understand it until they found a uh, pamphlet uh, by Ludwig von Mises uh, that explained uh, why some countries were poor and other um, uh, were more developed. And uh, after that, they decided to to go deeper uh, into the Austrian ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first, uh, one of the two first buildings, the, the library is called the Ludwig von Mises Library. And they decided very early that w- the, the mission of the university was to teach and disseminate the legal, the, the ethical, legal, and economic uh, ideas of uh, society of free and responsible persons. So what, regardless of what you study, you have five courses on liberty, the ethics of liberty, economics of liberty. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you, we study the, the work of Mises and the work of Hayek. So uh, it's, 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 it's beautiful and, and, and interesting to see uh, doctor, uh, um, doctors or, or architects uh, knowing the, the, the Austrian tradition very well. And uh, if you ask them, uh, whether this have helped them or not after they finish. Uh, they, they say that this was very this has been very important in their careers. Now you mentioned that the faculty are not judged in the same manner as they are in the United States, for example. You don't have a tenure system and that um, faculty really need to focus on their teaching. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, we, we run the university as, a, as, a, as if it were a for-profit organization. It is not. It's a non-profit, but it's, it's completely private, as, as you said. We don't accept public money. And we, we run it in a way that someone would run his, his company. Uh, nobody would give a job forever in life. Uh, so we don't, we don't give tenure. Uh, we don't have tenure. Uh, we ask every department to, be, to produce value. And uh, for that, we have internal prices. So if you want to rent a space, you, 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 you make a bid. And we have, when you have more demand for a room, the prices are higher. And uh, when you have less demand, the prices are lower. So people decide when, when, when to give their lectures uh, or departments decide. And, um, and yes, and, and then we have this core curriculum that put together with the dynamic of the internal markets that we have. And so we, you have on the one, uh, you have content, libertarian content, mm-hmm. uh, free market content, and you have also this, the structure of the university works as a free market uh, organization. So you have content and uh, structure. You also mentioned that to serve on the board, you have to be an entrepreneur. So you don't have academics as board members, which is very unlike most Western universities. Exactly. In order not to, to be at the board, you, you need to have experience in running an organization, running a, 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 an organization that creates value. And for that, uh, from the very beginning, everyone uh, since, and since it, the university was uh, created, uh, members of the board have to be entrepreneurs. Uh, and this, m- m- this makes a huge difference. You see that uh, those people they have the mission always in, in, in their mind. Uh, and at the same time, they want to make sure that whatever, every dollar that we spend is spent in a way, in, in, a, in a productive way mm-hmm. toward the mission of the university. Well, and you do some things that are outside of normal university offerings. For, uh, I want to promote, for example, you recently did uh, produced a MOOC, which is a massive open online course uh, on Don Quixote, 
which had, I think, yes. about 15,000 people from around the world viewed that. Um, so that's the kind of outside-the-box thinking. And, and how can people find that your, your course on Don Quixote? Well, if you go to UFM website, you will see Descubre Don Quixote, Discover Don Quixote. Uh, but if, if, if you Google it uh, or, or you go to EDX platform, you will find it. It has been a very successful uh, MOOC, uh, Massive Online Open Course, uh, where we, we you really learn about Don Quixote, uh, literature, history. Uh, and at the same time, you learn the connection between uh Don Quixote de la Mancha and the ideas of the school of Salamanca, so the, the free market ideas of the time. And it's very interesting to see how, for example, Don Quixote uh, horse, uh, Rocinante, the disease that he had. When, when Cervantes describes the horse, he describes the horse uh, with a disease in the legs, uh -huh. that which name, the name of the disease is the same uh, as the name we give to the consequence of inflation. So he's doing a parallel between the problem of inflation and the problem of the horse. And he says that that type of disease, if you allow it to go, um, 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 to expand, uh, since it is at the, f at the foundation of the horse, the whole horse will collapse, making a parallelism with society. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful course. Fortunately, people from 131 countries have been following it. And we are very happy to, to, to be delivering um, free market um, um, concepts and, and history through through Don Quixote. Now, another project you described to me is called what you call your business cycle observatory, which you uh, mentioned takes uh, Austrian principles and ap applies some business and finance tools to give real-time data on business cycles. So talk about that. Yeah, the market trends that we internally call it the, the business cycle observatory is the idea was originally um, to do what Mises and Hayek did uh, in Vienna. Um, 80 something years ago uh, close to 90 years ago they, they started this this observatory in Vienna and what they say is let, let's let's take the theory uh, let's use some tools from analytical tools also from the um, from the trade and investment uh, theory and le let's look at it and let's follow it and let's see whether we are close to a problem or, or we, we are having um, a sound expansion or not. And that, that is what we have been doing. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have been able to, to produce in Spanish and in English uh, quarterly reports, mm -hmm. also some monthly reports and weekly reports. And we are following what is going on in Latin America, in the U.S., in Europe, and in China, uh, using Austrian theory combined with uh, some uh, analytical tools, tools from uh, investment theory, and it, it has been a lot of fun uh, and also um, very challenging to 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 have to uh, to follow it and to report what is going on and what might come. We, we're not, we don't try to forecast. We try to analyze what is going on right now, but we always. Uh, uh, obviously have to say, okay, here, here seems to be a big problem, so be careful because if this continues, so we, we explain trends, uh, this is what we call market trends, uh, pattern predictions. And well, Gabriel, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you here live in Auburn. Um, we, we look forward to uh, new collaborations between the Mises Institute and UFM. And ladies and gentlemen, you have a great Thanksgiving weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.